Hi, morning everyone. Um, apologies for the coughs during the speak. Um, yeah, um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm a senior, senior solution architect at AWS, been with AWS for uh, uh, more than five years. Uh, before that with uh, different retailers for more than 15 years, helping them on the uh, cloud journey. Uh, that's my background. Um, John, do you want to do a quick intro? Jose, I'm John Walker, the Head of Architecture at Service HQ. Um, so my background has been in development, went from development through to architecture and then led multiple migrations over to AWS and then for the last four years I've been with Service HQ doing everything from migration, new builds, my services on AWS. So in today's talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to in high level cover why migrate in the first of all, what is the business driver here and uh, what is the benefit uh, you would get as part of migrating cloud. And John will talk about uh, um, the different ways you can modernize once you are in AWS. So that's how we're going to cover the content. So if you look at here, Thousands of customers have already completed large-scale migration to AWS. Um, uh, companies from Netflix, who we uh, know, Nordstrom, uh, BP, uh, Disney, HBO, so many customers who are already operating on AWS, like even financial institutions like Capital One. So why do we need to, what's the, what's the benefit these customers have seen, which we can take as a learning and a key takeaway, and which we can maybe see if any of them would be applicable for us. So if you look at it, Dow Jones, so as part of migrating uh, to AWS, Dow Jones have achieved 20% uh, percentage, 25% cost savings and also 30% uh, increased in product uh, development velocity because they are able to automate on cloud. Uh, so they were able to deliver fast and uh, uh, increase their product development uh, velocity. If you look at uh, Coca-Cola, so they migrated under 12 months uh, of their workloads, uh, around 600 workloads, if you look at it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's migration. What's the benefit? So if you look at it, 10-second uh, processing time cut from 36 hours. So they were able to reduce the uh, processing time, which is, uh, if you look at it, everything is tied up to a business benefit. So you need to understand what the business benefit of actually uh, migrating to cloud. Similarly, Expedia, so 5x increase in innovation pipeline and 360x um, faster data analysis. And uh, last one is uh, Live Nations, 58% uh, cost savings and also uh, f reduction in traditional IT task. So where you can actually remove the repeated task within your IT infrastructure and make those people focus on high value business deliverables. So these are Roughly a few of the benefits which the customers have obtained. I think uh, if you go to the AWS website under case studies, you can see different um, benefits which different customers have achieved over the years. So I talked about business benefits. Before you go into business benefits, what is the business trigger? When do you actually need to go and migrate um, a specific workload to cloud? There are multiple areas here. Okay. So starting from digital transformation where you're looking at the dynamic nature of the market with COVID and other things, you need to roll out changes in a very rapid way, okay? So you, if you understand the market condition, then you will think, okay, what's my velocity of delivery? Can I just improve? How could I improve? Going global um, quickly um, as well. So for example, I worked with a retailer who was able to roll out in-store pickup uh, to multiple customers across their globe uh, when COVID kicked off. Previously, they didn't had it, but because how AWS supports multiple regions, services available in multiple places, they were able to roll out and then able to reap the benefit of cloud and then address the ongoing challenge within the market. <coughs> Agility and staff productivity, how can you make sure your employees are kind of enthused? I think if you look at uh, recent uh, 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 recent employee interest in a role, it's not only salary nowadays. So work from home is there, okay? How fast you can deliver on the features? 
Can you work on new technologies? Um, so there is a lot of other factors comes into play uh, for our employees these days. So this is also important and, and agility is business agility. Um, so IoT and ML, so do you want to uh, dive into um, maybe IoT device, uh, devices or you are an online delivery shop? Do you want to uh, put some IoT devices on the vehicles to track where the delivery, when the delivery is going to happen? Or you can do in supply chain as well. And the next one is uh, improved operational uh, resiliency, scalability and security. I think uh, this is a, we already have these uh, kind of uh, operational resiliency, scalability and security within our on-prem data center. But if you look back, how operationally resilient it is, how scalable it is. I'll give you, again, sorry, I'm from retail background, so I'm going to pull up some retail use case based on my personal experience. Scalability. During the COVID time, if you look at it, everyone was trying to order online and the websites were down because no one expected so many people to log into a website to order online. A lot of websites went down, but few of sites implemented a queuing mechanism. Okay, so how quick is, can you actually scale your infrastructure to implement a queuing mechanism to, um, to actually to, uh, to support that uh, demand? The main challenge with this, I think that even though the customer were able to implement the scalable mechanism, the supply chain was broken. They didn't have enough product to deliver to the customer. The technology was there. You see, that's how you need to be prepared. So you need to think forefront, okay, if something happens, there was a worst case scenario, uh, which we went through, yeah, but still. And the next one is data center consol consolidation. So most of you have long contracts uh, with your data center company. So if it is up for renewal, give it a thought. How, what kind of benefits I could achieve as part of moving to cloud based on your business priorities. The last one is uh, cost reduction. So how can you reduce the cost from CapEx to OpEx? Because once you operate on AWS, it will be an OpEx cost. So you don't need to put upfront um, a lot of these servers, buy in, buy in upfront. Again, typical example, unfortunate situations. Uh, you can't go and get servers <coughs> or uh, um, scale your infrastructure immediately. Um, the next one is uh, outsourcing charges, for example, the end of line. There are a lot of tools um, which has licensing constraint attached to it. Okay, so if there is outs uh, outsourcing charges and also end of life hardware or software coming up, you need to think through: Do I still need to get stuck with this old way of working? Can I move from this paid software to an open source software and then make sure uh, someone is managing it so that I don't need to do the heavy lifting? I can just consume it. So these are the uh, high level areas where you need to look at as a business trigger uh, when migrating to cloud. So as part of doing it, I think we talked about few customer examples. What eventually customers are achieving is uh, again 31% uh, cost saving compared to their on-prem infrastructure and also 62% more efficient IT infrastructure staff. Another key question which uh, gets triggered is okay, yeah, if I move all my IT infrastructure onto AWS or to a cloud, um, how do what do I do with the people who are already operating? So you train them and then you cross skill them. So that is that is really important, training your employees and then getting them uh, actually do some business deliverable rather than if you can offload some of your um, non-differentiated heavy lifting to someone, you should do it because what's your core business while you're operating something else? So that is something which uh, people think and uh, see it as a business outcome. And the agility, I think with, with cloud, I think you have the, you have the tools to automate your complete infrastructure, which was a bit challenging before. So this actually enabled you to improve the agility within the team and also delivery uh, within, your, within your system. So we talked about business triggers, we talked about business outcome. We have a lot of learnings from different customers over the years. So if you haven't been on the journey, you are in a better position because you can learn from different companies who have already gone through the migration and then make sure you don't repeat any of the mistakes they went or learn from the best practices which they used 
to migrate onto uh, the cloud so so if you look at what is the guidance for strong guidance is you need to have a strong executive sponsorship when you are going on this journey because you are transforming your whole IT infrastructure to support the business so someone has to be there to back this is going to take time okay and this needs to be closely followed and you need to have a strong executive sponsor to make sure they are keeping the boards happy and also providing clarity to the teams so this is really key for a successful migration and you need to set bold and outcome focused goals so once you are there um, you need to make sure you need to keep the bar high so that the teams are working towards it uh, uh, to actually to deliver the best possible uh, outcome for your business and uh, uh, build early momentum and gain expense do a POC um, uh, do a small POC on the uh, on the cloud do some learning see where the gaps are and then you can learn from it as well and last one is take a portfolio driven approach so identify a key portfolio within uh, your organization which you're going to use to migrate onto cloud and then use that to build the early momentum and also gain expertise as well these are some of the guidance we learned from um, thousands of customer migrations so i talked about business um, business driver um, business triggers so how do we how do i go about doing a migration these are the common patterns which we see with customers uh, one is uh, 50 percentage in lift and shift people just lift their current infrastructure and move into cloud and then they modernize which john will be covering in bit detail the next one is you go through your portfolio and you decide okay i don't need to no longer operate this infrastructure let me buy some SaaS product and use the SaaS uh, product so that's one thing and the next one is as part of the portfolio analysis you might decide this application is not at all used i'll retire it and the last one is uh, modernization which john will be covering in high level so this has built a program called migration modernization acceleration program which provides the methodology tools partners who are key here and also investment uh, training and services let's go through what are the approaches within this uh, program this is a three-step approach so first is assess where you discover your current infrastructure your current IT estate so for example rapid discovery or migration evaluation there are tools available so the reason why I'm showing this is these are the three-step approach and we have tools built for the customer to leverage these tools to help them on their migration journey so a few of the tools I will call as a migration readiness assessment which are which will go through your whole like IT portfolio and then call out uh, what software package what it runs on how what 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 will be the recommendation for them to be migrated to AWS so you, you assessed it then you need to mobilize so build momentum and gain experience by migrating as a few of the small components um, as well so for example this this is where you need to put up a migration plan so you have a clarity how you're going to migrate and then you have a migration evaluators where you will talk about different tools which will help you on the migration and then uh, and then landing zone so landing zone is something like you need to have proper security in place on aws before you actually operate on aws so everything comes with some best practices so the landing zone helps you to build the high level infrastructure uh, on aws before you actually operate on aws and also one of the key thing is operating model the operating model will completely change because the way you operate at the moment within the on-premise world and the way you operate in cloud is a bit different so you need to make sure the operating model is defined and proper organization change is happened to support it and the last one is uh, migrate so once you have um, so you have defined all the uh, basic infrastructure on AWS then as part of migrating so how do you scale you define how are you going to scale that infrastructure which you have built on AWS how are you going to optimize and also how you're going to modernize so 
Eight plus is uh, investing uh, in this area uh, specifically to remove the barriers uh, through automation and tooling. And these tools are completely free for customers um, to uh, migrate from the current infrastructure to AWS. So, which so the reason for having this tool is it provides you uh, fast, non-disruptive, flexible, and uh, and a secure way of uh, doing this migration. <coughs> Okay, so this is a lot of text on the slide. So I talked about the three-step approaches. So these are the different kinds of tools which AWS provides for customers to leverage um, in different phases of their migration assets, mobilize, migrate and modernization. You might think, wow, this is so overwhelming. I don't have the skill set within my organization uh, to actually to go through that journey. I think that's where um, the partners uh, comes into the picture because we have uh, 130 plus AWS migration competency partner who have advanced AWS certification and also they have done some migration so you can learn from their experience you can pass it on to their safe hands there's so many partners here so as I mentioned 130 plus so so one of those partners is uh, Ceres HQ. So I'm going to pass it on to John, who is going to talk through about uh, how their organization works and also um, and also how to modernize uh, once you are on AWS. Hi everyone. Um, so as Emma mentioned, um, my name is John Walker, I'm the Head of Architecture at Service HQ. So we're an AWS Advanced Partner who specialise in migration, but also in education and DevOps. So we have these competencies from AWS, which if you've not really heard that term before, it's a, essentially an audit that AWS goes through to determine whether we can do something. So we need to demonstrate knowledge within each of these areas. So we've migrated previous customers over to AWS and quite large customers. And we then present that information to AWS and they approve us to be a migration partner. And that allows us to go part of the migration acceleration program that Inman mentioned, which allows us to provide people with uh, expertise, guidance, funding from AWS to actually help you get onto AWS because there's so much to learn in a migration and so many different places to start that having a partner there who's done it all before is a good way to do that migration because we know the things that will go wrong and we can help you go through that. And just quickly, I'm going to share two customer examples that we've previously done. And this is a, there's a link here to a case study on our website. The first one here is uh, White Rose Mass, who are uh, an education provider. So they have a, like a learning platform for schools where people can log in, all the way through primary and secondary school and do maths problems. But during the, the pandemic, they found that they went from a couple of thousand requests a month to hundreds of thousands a day, and their, their system couldn't cope with that scale. So we, they engaged with us, and within 36 hours, we'd migrated them over to AWS and had them running at scale, and they've been running at that scale ever since. Um, so that was a really great uh, project for us. We, we worked really hard with the customer to get them back up and running because the website was falling over every five minutes um, and getting them onto AWS gave them that scalability. And next example is just uh, SIPFA. So that's the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy. So they do a lot to do with uh, like accountancy qualifications and also local government to do with um, inventory mapping. So all, all the like councils where they have um, different buildings that they own, then they track all that through SIPFA. Uh, they have a, a asset manager application. But they had all these legacy applications on multiple different data centers and they wanted to move to the cloud, but also then modernize. So we helped them design a networking architecture within AWS, migrated seven of the largest workloads over and then since then, we've actually helped them move from 
move away from a Windows-based application to a microservices architecture on one of their uh, main platforms. And that's been working really well for them. So one thing I just wanted to quickly cover just on why you would want to move to the cloud. Um, just this maybe at a slightly more basic level is cloud basically runs on a pay as you go model. So where on premise you might pay thousands a month or like upfront for a server that you're going to keep for 18 months, on the cloud you're only paying for what you're actually using. And that also includes when you turn it off. So if you've got an application that say it runs nine to five, you can have five servers that deal with all your traffic during the day. And then at five o'clock, you scale that down to one server. So it still works overnight, but you have nowhere near the traffic. And that flexibility and scaling saves you a lot of money. There's customers that can save like up to 70% just doing that part of it. Never mind all the rest of the uh, benefits that you get. Also, when you move to AWS, there's a lot of automation you can build in, especially through um, like CICD pipelines for deploying code onto applications. So things like code pipeline, uh, code deploy, you can get your application that you've written or an application that you're installing, say like WordPress, you can automate the deployment of that application to the cloud, whether that's through EC2 instances, so virtual machines, or if you're going serverless or containers, all that can be automated. And what that allows you to do is go into a DevOps model where rather than having to do like a release every three months of your, your software, you can move to multiple times a day and you can commit your code and it'll, it'll just deploy and you don't really need to worry about it. And you can, you can run tests, you can roll back when things go wrong. Um, and you can also use the latest technology. So there's a lot of innovation in terms of what you can do with the cloud because of the scale of Amazon. Um, things like using Lambda and DynamoDB to do fully serverless, um, there's things I was reading recently about what micro front ends, um, where it's like microservices where you've split up all your application, but you do that for the front end as well. So each part of your application has its own stack and you can actually deploy that to AWS and it, it means that you can scale individual parts of your application as you need to. So if your booking process needs a lot more scalability than say the details page of a particular, um, that your thing that you're selling, then you can scale that up independently. And one of the other sort of benefits, and I think this will why it loaded into that, but um, cost is quite a big thing for going to the cloud. It's usually one of the main reasons people want to go to the cloud. As I mentioned, you'll pay for what you use and you're scaling with your requirements, but not just on the actual, like say, website side. You can have uh, your database scale automatically, depending on the traffic you've got. And it all really comes down to the fundamental part of AWS is that you're paying for what you use and you're only paying for what you use. That can be a bit of a double-edged sword, just as a, a warning. If you allow things to spiral out of control, say you have a mistake in your automation and it automatically spins things up that shouldn't be there, you're going to pay for that as well. Um, so it's, there is a bit of a a warning there. Um, and as Emma mentioned, there's generally in the cloud there's a sort of OPEX versus CAPEX model. You can, rather than going for paying up front with a machine that you're stuck with for 18 months, two years, you're only paying for what you use. So you're paying it every month, but it allows you to react much quicker to, to new demand and actually scale up or scale down depending on what you need. And I just quickly want to mention there is also reserved instances and savings plans. So these are ways that you can still pay Amazon upfront for the, um, the resources that you're going to use. So say, for example, if you've got EC2 instances where you know your website is going to be running nine to five and you've, you've decided on the type of server you're going to use, you can then buy a reserved instance that will offset the cost on that. So you can pay for those instances upfront for a year or three years, and then you don't pay monthly for them. And it works on a credit-based system where, depending on how many you use, say you buy a reserved instance that's credits of two servers for an entire year. If you use four servers for half a day and then one at night, it'll work out pro rata based on what you've actually used. You're not linked to just using two servers. So it will use up the credits as you, as you go. So moving on, there's um, 
one of the things I just wanted to quickly cover, just this is applicable to migrations, but also workloads that are already on AWS. Um, AWS came up with this framework called the Well-Architected Framework. And what this allows you to do is it takes all of the learning that AWS have found from all the companies that they've worked for and it distills it into a set of best practice on how you should run things in the cloud or what you should be looking out for. So it's split into six pillars and each of them can be reviewed individually. But the way this, this works is we, as a partner, the well-architected principles for each of these pillars are built into everything that we do. So we'll design systems to be scalable or and secure and cost optimal. But during the migration, we'll also perform a review of what we're doing. So if you've already got things in the cloud, so say you've done, done the best you can, you've built up a server, but you're not quite sure that it's actually following best practices, we can come in and actually review that and say, well, you should, for security, for example, you should lock down your security groups. You should um, remove any IAM users, like login credentials that you're not using. Um, you should protect all your different systems with a firewall. All, all these types of best practices. So as I say, it's broken down into six. So the security covers all of the security. So that's from um, data traffic going in and out, encryption, access to the, the systems. Operational excellence is about how you operate that workload. So if you've got something, one, sorry, <laughs> 10 minutes, right? Um, so if you've got something running on the cloud, then operational excellence is, do you actually have details on, if someone new comes into your business, how it runs, what, I have like a, an operating procedure. Um, and if you want to know more about the well-architected framework, we are in the expo hall just as soon as you go in, we're on stand C1, right, as, as you go in, so discuss that. Um, so I'll quickly go through the, the rest of these. So. Um, there's end user compute options. So these are, if you want to run applications for your users, what you can do is have AppStream, which will, say you have something like AutoCAD that requires a graphics driver. You can then have that stream to an end user's device so they can run it on a tablet. So we've done things like AutoCAD, ArcGIS, Unity. So all the like heavy programs you need really high uh, CPU and memory and GPU to run. You run all of that in the cloud, and then the end user just needs a, a basic laptop or a tablet. Uh, and workspaces is similar, but it's a full desktop in the cloud. And in terms of, this is kind of more the modernization step, where once you actually get into the cloud and you've got all your, uh, your workloads in there, you can start to use some of the services that run as cloud native. So these first two are to do with uh, like containers. So um, if you've got Docker containers you want to run or you want to run Kubernetes clusters, Amazon have ECS and EKS, and then Fargate, which is a fully managed solution. So for the first two, you're actually running the underlying server yourself. So it's an EC2 instance, which gives you more control. But then with Fargate, you give that control to Amazon and they basically run all the underlying infrastructure and you just need to worry about your containers. Um, and DynamoDB, uh, this one, um, that's a fully managed NoSQL database and that is basically infinitely scalable because that's the database that runs Amazon.com. So on Prime Day, that is doing 100 million transactions a second um, and it, it works every year. The, one, basically Amazon built this for Amazon.com and went, this is quite good, we'll sell it to everyone else. Um, so that's how the, the scaling works. Uh, and I mentioned the CICD, so all about automation and and DevOps, so there's, you can use things like Code Pipeline CloudFormation is the infrastructure's code one. Um, that is the Amazon tools, but you can also use things like Terraform, Pulumi, Chef, Puppet, Ansible. Whatever your current tools are, you can still use them in the cloud. And one of the good things about AWS is that AWS has 200 different services and probably they launch like 3,000 new features every year, but the vast majority of them are interoperable. So if you've got an EC2 instance and you want to get logs from that, it'll go to CloudWatch. But if you're a Docker container, that will also go to CloudWatch. Um, and things like S3 and Lambda are the glue between all the different services. So, <coughs> excuse me. So S3 is your object store. So that's where you store your files. So you can do different things with that. So like say, say you have a website and you want all your images cached there and run through a CDN. 
you put all that in S3 and stick a cloud front in front of it. But S3 can then also be used to take all your data and start running that in your AI and ML applications in SageMaker. Um, so there's core services that link everything together, but there's also um, services that run very specific workloads on their own. Um, and just quickly, the last kind of couple of slides just here on, on AI and ML. The way I kind of see Amazon is there's two main distinct areas with AI and ML. There's the ones that you don't need the AI experience for. So things like recognition where you can give it a bunch of uh, photos and say, tell me what's in those photos. Or one of the examples uh, Amazon have is like, say you're doing a ride sharing app and you want to have a profile picture that can identify that person. But for that picture, then the person needs to have their eyes uncovered, they can't be wearing sunglasses, can't be wearing a hat. You can run that through recognition and it will tell you, are they wearing a hat, do they have sunglasses, are they smiling, what is, what's the probability of what their emotion is. Um, and all that's pre-built. And same with the rest of these services, like so you've got Transcribe, which will take audio and make it text. Comprehend, which will actually give you relationships between data within a document. Um, there's also Comprehend Medical, which can understand medical terms, uh, forecasting and uh, the, the fraud detector. So all, again, a lot of these came out of Amazon.com. So like fraud detector, they decide, they figured out how they can actually figure out um, who's doing fraudulent transactions. And they took all that learning, all, all the, the data that they'd gathered, built a model out of it, and then they provide that to end customers in AWS. So you benefit from Amazon's 20 years of experience on figuring out what fraud is. Um, and then if you do have ML experience, the generally all the ML stuff within AWS is covered under SageMaker. And there's various different parts of that from running machine learning and notebooks, um, the full SageMaker tool set, which includes hundreds of different services, like running training and um, actually running your models. But one of the things I just kind of wanted to point out here is there's an auto ML tool that Amazon have uh, under SageMaker where you can give it data and tell it what you want to try and figure out. So say you're doing a classification problem, that's generally the solved models out there that will tell you what type of things. So like, um, like K-means clustering, there's various different ones. You don't need to start from scratch. And what Amazon can do is run all those various different models against your data simultaneously and tell you what the best one is. And you get all the different scores back from each one. And you don't need to do any of that. You just give it the data, tell it what you're looking for, and it'll run 10 of the most popular models against your data. And then it'll, you'll get all the different prediction scores back. Um, so that, that's a really interesting area where Amazon are starting to build on their ML experience, but make it easier for people to actually to use these systems. Um, so these, just the last, I think these are the last two slides here, just um, in terms of migration, I think I mean, kind of covered this. When you're looking for a migration, try to understand why you want to migrate in the first place. So do a business case and then this assessment and readiness, this is where we can help out and say, well, what do you need to be able to migrate to the cloud? What are your skills required? And we can give you a detailed assessment of where you are just now, where we can take you to and where you can go in the future in terms of your full migration and full um, journey to AWS. And then there's just some, some links here just on Amazon Cloud migration. The immersion day and workshops are really useful if you want to go a bit more in depth for AWS. We can also run an immersion day for you where we'll come in and show you an example of taking say, taking something on-premise and actually moving it to the cloud. Um, but we can take you through the whole process. And the workshops, not just for migration, this actually covers everything. So things like, if you want to know how to deploy a Kubernetes cluster on AWS, there's a workshop for that. If you want to know how to use serverless, there's a, a workshop for that as well. And then just quickly on the training, this is the last one. There's a lot of training and certification available from Amazon. So things like the skillsbuilder.aws, there's a lot of information you can get from there. And Amazon have, they have 12 different certifications uh, that you can go through and they're split into sort of four categories. You have your base level one, which is the um, cloud practitioner. And that's just familiarity with AWS. 
Then you have the associate level, which is your, you know how to run things in AWS, you know how, it, how things interact. And then there's the professional level, which is more in depth and you can actually design things in AWS. And then there's six speciality ones like machine learning, uh, security, big data, and a few more where you're really going deep into the, um, into the weeds of actually using those services. So, um, with, uh, within Cirrus, one of the things that we do as a partner is we, uh, allow people to do certifications and we encourage them to get different levels. So like, for example, when I started at Cirrus, I had one certification and in the three and a half years I've been there, I'm now at six. Um, so I've got both professionals, two of the associates, the cloud practitioner and the machine learning specialty one. And I'm probably doing the security one as well. Um, and if you do go through the certification process, if you get all 12, which is a bit of a nightmare, um, Amazon will give you a gold jacket. So <laughs> yep. And I think that, that's us. So thanks very much for your time. And th <laughs>
AWS will give you a box of Lego. Sometimes they'll give you the instructions, sometimes they won't. But you can build whatever you need to with it. Whereas uh, on Azure and GCP, you'll get, a, you'll get something already built, essentially. And um, that's usually the main difference, I think. Zoom and GCP are maybe, the developer experience is maybe a bit better, their console is maybe a bit more friendly, but the power of AWS dwarfs the other two in my opinion. So. Right, thank you. That's probably the best answer I've heard from Cool, cheers. So, um, I don't have Imran to, to thanks, so hope he's not dying. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> that is a, okay, is a... So thanks Imran, thanks Imran. Thanks Imran. Thanks Imran.